technical assistance also help countries share and apply innovative knowledge and solutions to their most pressing challenges. So that's in a nutshell who we are and what we do. And your so in that context, your learners are governmental professionals in in the countries you serve. What, what who who what is it? What comprises your um, learner base? So our audience. Um, you know, one unique element of the, so uh, let me start. Our primary audience of for our learning programs or capacity building programs are policymakers and practitioners in government mm-hmm. from emerging countries, as well as, um, you know, other development actors such as the NGOs, the private sector, the academia, as well as civil service who all work in the de- development spectrum. Um, so one unique element that I want to point out uh, that sort of differentiates us from academia and private sector is that is the practitioner aspect. You know, it is not about a theoretical exchange, but more on how to um, how to uh, solve whatever the trickiest challenges a country or a region is facing. And the other unique element is that most of the learners are also experts here. So if you're getting together. Um, a series, um, let's say a capacity building uh, program uh, around cities and climate change, Um, a lot of the um, participants might be mayors from Mumbai and Barcelona and New York, and they each are experts as well as learning from each other. So that's how I would like to um, say that we're different. It's a community, sounds like a community driven effort in many respects and, and knowledge exchange as well as just sort of transfer of knowledge. One of the things that I've learned from talking to people in the development sector in particular is the importance of this phrase capacity building. Well, what does capacity building mean to you uh, in the context of World Bank and, and more broadly in, in the development sector? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, while capacity building really suggests building new from the ground up, um, usually, according to some pre-imposed, uh, pre-imposed design, yeah. I, you know, we yeah. talk about it more as capacity development. Uh, perhaps a better choice, as it better expresses an approach that builds on existing skills and knowledge, um, driving a more dynamic and flexible process of change, closely borne by local actors. So, I prefer the word uh, capacity development. And uh, yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, capacity development is a core concept of development policy. And it plays, you know, the, we talked about the twin goals, and it plays a critical role in achieving uh, achieving those, as well as the SDGs. So what uh, to unpack this a little bit, capacity building really is a process, um, you know, by which individuals, but also organizations, enhance their skills, their knowledge, their experiences to improve job performance, and effectively respond to new challenges, including climate change, resource fragility, fast-changing educational requirements, and so on. So Mm -hmm. if you look at, um, you know, what it means to achieve the SDGs, it's going to be particularly challenging in sub-Saharan Africa because so many countries face the dual challenge of adapting to climate change, but also building institutional frameworks that respond to these fragility and conflict and violence. So the capacities Mm. of these countries to respond and adapt requires a suite of enabling policies, investment programs aimed at building awareness, deepening adaptive competencies and skills, and building um, even accountability of service providers, right? So capacity Mm. building, the way we look at it, is a multifaceted concept That includes providing support for leadership development in these fragile and conflict-affected countries and emerging countries, building a culture that promotes risk-taking, creating incentives for continuous innovation, all of which contribute to robust and sustainable development. So capacity building is at the core of the work we do. Yeah, I love it because it's definitely a sort of more organizational lens on learning development. We think a lot about, you know, developing individuals and training individuals, but this is so much sort of bigger picture kind of phrase, and I, I like it for that reason. Perhaps we could sort of dive down a little bit and and talk about talk about the open learning campus itself. Can you describe it for us? And I think you've talked a little bit about how it impacts the development work 
of, of the World Bank, but can you describe Open Learning Campus for us? Sure. I'm going to start with the why does a, a institute like institution like the World Bank need an open learning campus? And um, basically, you know, knowledge, and we found that knowledge and particularly learning capacity building is key to de uh, solving development challenges and meeting the twin goals as we talked about. I mean, whether it's mm -hmm. mitigating the harmful effects of climate change or reskilling and upskilling youth to find jobs relevant uh, for the fourth industrial revolution or creating effective health systems for the poor and elderly, the development process is often challenged by multiple interdependent factors. And mitigating these factors requires a behavior change or a transformational change, if you will, that has to be harnessed by continuous learning. So really, our vision for the Open Learning Campus, um, as I said before, was a, a sort of a place, a go-to destination for learning on international development uh, with two broad goals. One, to provide a platform where our own staff in over 100 countries are learning continuously to stay cutting edge on technical areas. And by technical, I don't mean technology, but more areas like um, education, infrastructure, um, macroeconomics. So cutting edge on the technical areas, but also the operational areas, you know, the, the different types of loans and so such that the World Bank provides on the business skills and leadership skills. And the second important goal is that the World Bank is a treasure trove of lessons and good practices around development and a fairly significant uh, amount is spent on creating what we call flagships or knowledge products, which are semin uh, seminal research and evidence-based work, but often hidden in three to 500 pages of um, a printed material. Mm -hmm. um, so barely 5% barely of this gets converted to actionable learning and insights. And so the second big objective of the Open Learning Campus is to provide a platform or an ecosystem, if you will, where our staff and our clients worldwide are learning together to co-create solutions to development challenges like competitive cities or public-private partnerships, or um, as I said, um, you know, how do you deal with air quality management mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so forth, complex challenges that um, impact uh, the different countries. Yeah, but it, it, it's interesting and uh, people can some, check it out online and very quickly get a sense of just the breadth of things that you um, that you that you guys cover in, in your programs. Um, pretty comprehensive stuff. Okay. And it's, it's, it's very dynamic in that continuously lessons from across the globe are being packaged and made available, um, you know, to audiences in different formats, whether it's uh, bite-sized learning or full-length uh, MOOCs or structured learning or even um, just uh, exchanges like I talked to you about the different mayors talking about the impacts of climate change on their cities. Yeah, I mean, you, there appears there seems to be a lot of a very sort of comprehensive um, set of uh, techniques and tools that you use as the campus. It's not just a purely online learning e-learning site, right? It's a it's broader than that. Not at all. And in fact, I'd like to say it's not at all about digital learning only. I mean, o OLC covers face to face and the different types of blends and so on. Um, it's just that having it available online has enabled us to scale up and disseminate in more flexible and convenient formats. But it's certainly not about just putting some stuff on the web. And, you know, it's most of our learning is because development is so complex. Most of our learning is facilitated uh, by face to face or virtual or regional experts and so on. So for me, what's really interesting about the open learning campus is perhaps the word open. <laughs> Can you talk about what you think the private sector can learn about your approach uh, to the Open Learning Campus? 
So learning for development is certainly beyond transfer of knowledge. Uh, and the reason why is we have to think about how is learning different in, in this uh, sphere. Uh, first off, it's multi-sectoral. You know, it's it's one thing. Everything everything is linked to everything else. So, uh, you know, you if you're talking about urbanization, you'll have to think about climate change. You have to tell, think about health. You have to think about education. And so, um, when you're learning, you have to uh, apply a multi-sectoral lens. Secondly, given what I told you about who our audience all is in terms of practitioners and government officials and so on. Uh, it's very results focused. You know, our focus is around evidence based solutions that are translated into practical and accessible learning. These are very busy practitioners. Uh, and our goal is to um, build, um, you know, build capacity to make diff better policy and so on. Um, also, um, something to think about is, you know, constantly given that the development challenges are so complex, one has to evaluate what works, what doesn't work, uh, how can they be improved. Um, also a blend of not just good practices, but also uh, what's failed and how can we fail fast and get moving. Mm, yeah. The balance of local and global, this is another huge issue because you can't take, um, you know, we talked about sharing knowledge, peer-to-peer -peer learning, but it's not something that you take from one country and just copy and paste it, if you will, into another country. There's the contextualization and what works and a careful um, distilling of what can apply. And this is where um, the mix of global and local becomes very important. And as you rightly said, there is the shift from this expert uh, transfer of knowledge to creating environments, you know, creating um, mm. experiences and leveraging experts and curricula and community to co-create solutions. It is not about, um, you know, us telling our client countries what to do, but to co-create them together um, is, is another important point. And um, two, two last things here is um, what we found is, especially for practitioner learning, uh, in the public sector, we need to bring learning to their point of need, where they're able to curate their own playlists of learning and mix and match different offerings. And uh, one thing I have found is this entire paradigm shift for um, this new approach to learning also requires unlearning and letting go of what's not on the critical path. And many uh, seasoned professionals both within our staff and clients, find this difficult to do. Well, that's really interesting uh, insight, uh, this unlearning. Peter Diamantis, for example, talks about something called the agility quotient, which is the ability to learn new things and unlearn old things has been a really important differentiator for the future. And he puts it in the context of the fourth industrial revolution. And I know that you do a lot of work on the future of work and the impact of the fourth industrial revolution. You've been involved in rolling out the World Bank's new human capital index, which I think talks about the link between investments in health and education and the productivity of workers in the future. What, what, what have you learned through that study and how important is that to your work and your mission? So I kind of break that up into two parts, uh, Chris, because um, we've done some work around. Uh, so just to start out, the World Bank brings out a seminal report each year um, on, on a major topic of concern to, to the world in developing countries, and they call the World Development Report, the WDR. And so the WDR of 2019 uh, was around the future of work. And um, linked to that, the World Bank also launched the new Human Capital Index and Initiative, uh, which, as you said, uh, highlights the links between investments in health and education and the productivity of workers. So I'll kind of respond to the Perfect. key messages from both of this and how it impacts the work we do. Um, so so first off, in, in terms of the WDR and the changing of nature of work, um, what we're learning is that firms must adopt new ways of production, um, you know, 
Um, as, and overall, that technology brings opportunity, paving the way to create new jobs and increase productivity, and also de uh, deliver effective public services. But in order for, uh, for that to, uh, to happen,